Welcome to Scribes. I am Michael Robert Berry of Berry and Croft, and this is my partner, Laura L. Croft. And today, we are talking about sports. So we are hoping that all of you people who are very traditional book fans will still watch this show, because you should. This pertains to a lot of different things and not just sports. It's kind of funny that I work in a library and I go to the gym in the same town and almost none of the same people go to both places. But anyway, I don't know why true. that is because we both are very athletic and we love to read. Okay, that's not entirely true. He's athletic. I'm not. But anyway. We love to read. <laughs> we very so, much do. <laughs> but, but this isn't all about us. Uh, tonight's guest is, yes, Helen, is. M. <laughs> Helen M. Williams. She's the author of this book, Coach Like a Mother and uh, a guide for the 21st century sports coach. Um, she is impressive in many ways. She um, has a Bachelor of Science in Health and a Master's Degree in Counselor Education. She has been in athletics for 25 years where she has um, spent time at Division One, Two, and Three institutions such as Lenoir, Len, Lenoir Rhine University, Wake Forest University, University of Southern Florida, Western Michigan University, U.S. Naval Academy, Princeton University, Merrimack College, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, otherwise known as MIT, that would have been easier for me to say, <laughs> and Harvard University. Um, at this point, her company, HMW Sports Consulting, conducts seminars for coaching staffs to fulfill her mission of engaging coaches and helping them improve their, their skills and understand their roles in the lives of people they work with. She is a remarkable woman and her book is remarkable. We are so excited to have her with us tonight. Helen, thank you so much for making the trip to be with us on Scribes. It's great to have you here. Well, thank you. I'm really excited to be here. So I'm going to start by asking you about this title. <laughs> Well, so. <laughs> um, it's a bit of a double entendre, obviously. But um, it took us a while to get that, embarrassingly. Yeah. Um, we were like, Where, yes. when does the mother part come yes. in? And they're like, oh, yes. the mother part. Um, <laughs> it actually, you know, <laughs> mothers are the original coaches. They teach, they motivate, they educate, they discipline, they do a lot of things that sports coaches do. Mm -hmm. And um, so my editor and I were just sort of kicking things around. and. I had another title for it that was way too long and what was not it? as catchy. It was it was whose idea was it to coach anyway? And he said, No, that's not gonna work. Um, so we kicked it around and, and that's finally what we came up with and it's it's a pretty catchy title. It is catchy. It's very yeah. memorable. It, it is. is very me yeah. memorable. It is definitely. <laughs> so um, it's the subtitle is a guide for the twenty first century sports coach. And I think you have grounded this book very much in the current time. Um, the thing that sp sprang out to me um, f of everything that was in here, but there are a lot of things, but the thing that sprang out to me first or, or most is that you work with young people, you work with college age kids, or you have right. at this point, you're, right. you've moved past that phase, yes, but your bulk of your experience years. is coaching college students. Yes. And there's a generation gap. Yes. A lot of people who work with kids, college and younger, get very frustrated with the different difference in attention span and mm -hmm. lack of discipline and the, a sense of entitlement that you did talk about very honestly in here. Yes. What I found really stood out to me was that you have an amazing respect and and faith in these kids that I, I how do you how are, how do you have such a positive attitude and why why do you not have any of the how does this book not have any of the frustration <laughs> I have grown to expect whenever I talk with anyone who works with young people these days? Well, I, I think, you know, we were all 17 to 22 years old. And so I think if you kind of remember that, we didn't know what we know now at that age. And I think the kids that are growing up today are so amazing. They're so smart and they're inventing and going to invent all of these wonderful things that, that are going to change the world. And so I just found it a privilege to be able to work with them and try to give them the foundational things that don't change regardless of, you know, the generation. Hard work, respect for others, treating people the way that you want to be treated. There's certain things that do not change ever. And I wanted to help them have that that foundation. But I think people get frustrated because we want things done the way we did it. And 
the old school way sometimes is good, but there's, there's nothing wrong with technology. There's nothing wrong with doing things different. It's not better or worse. It just is, and you have to, as I mentioned in the book, I, I envy their ability to do more than one thing and, be able, and to be able to compartmentalize. And, and so I think they have a lot of skills that, that would benefit us if, you know, if we had them. I just cared about the kids. I think that that's, it's such a cliche when people say kids don't know, you know, they don't care about what you know until they know you care. But it's so true. You, you take a kid from their parents and you essentially are uh, responsible for that kid in, in a sense in helping them continue to grow. And, and you're an extension of their parents. And I just enjoyed working with them. And, and, and I would see things every day that would remind me of how awesome and great they were. And I just wanted to try to teach them that. Now, part of that is you had to do things that they weren't very happy with when you had to discipline them. But that's part of being a coach. That's part of coaching the right way. And it's, it's the same problem that parents have. Kids know they need discipline. They just don't like it when mm -hmm. they get it. Right. Yeah. 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 That was a good that point. Is, that is something that I noticed about the, this book. I mean, you have the, the title is Coach Like a Mother, but you could easily take coach out of it and put a lot of things in there. And when I was reading it, one of the things I got out of it the most was my responsibility as a parent to make sure that my kids are prepared when they get to a college level, when they get sure. to somebody like you who could coach them or whatever. And um, it just struck me when you were given the example in the book about the, the girl who couldn't mail in an, a letter. Yes. You know, you had to take her into the post office and get her yeah. the stamp and sure. And, and to me, that's something that tells me there's a responsibility for me as a father to make sure that my kids are not only safe, but prepared to go out into the world. But I think it falls back to you as a parent. What are you doing? Are you involved? Like you were saying, it's not just about them on the courts, it's about being part of their life and knowing that you have to be the bad guy sometimes. Nobody likes it, but you don't do anybody any favors if, if you don't show them the repercussions. Like the one girl you had doing, I think it was push-ups or something, yeah. and running around the courts, yeah. I'm surprised she could play. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think, first of all, I, one of the things in the book, it's, it's applicable to parenting and teaching. Anybody who deals with quote unquote the 21st century kid. Um, I think we'll get a lot, of, a lot out of this book. But I also think that, you know, I'm sure previous generations, their mothers said the same things about them, their fathers said the same things about them, and then their grandfathers said the same thing about them. Right. So right. I don't, you know, I don't think that that's, you know, that's, that's going to change. You just have to try to, you know, make adjustments. Mm -hmm. And um, the world changes, and you have to change with it, and you have to be accepting of that change. But again, as I said earlier, there are certain foundational things that don't change, regardless of the generation. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and that's true. That, that is definitely true. But yeah, like I said, I think the title of this book, and I hope people realize that as you read this book, this does pertain to a lot of things, not just coaching, you know? Yeah. And I mean, even for us, it could be like writing like a mother, publishing <laughs> like a mother. I could be a father like a mother. Well, I, I, you are, I, you are. I wanted to just share things that I learned. It just happens to be through the prism yeah. of sports because that's that's what I do. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, when we choose books, I, um, people often ask what are our criteria when we choose books, but and the topic is extremely broad, so we don't limit ourselves to any specific topic. But sure. what we do really look for are good quality writing, someone who really has something to say, someone who can articulate it on camera. You know, we, we have a lot of things in our head that we look for. Um, and it's, it's funny that I did not expect this book to relate to me. Um, like I <laughs> joked about in the introduction, I am a very unathletic person. I, I've started going to the gym recently, but me in sports, no, 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 no. And I was telling Mike, I'm, like it brought back childhood memories. I was always picked last for every team. And to this day, I actually, I've, I have actually been able to get over the, this, the feeling of stigma of being picked last, but here's what I haven't gotten over, and this just cracks me up. I still feel bad for the teams that got me. That's how bad I was. <laughs> the team that was stuck with me at the end, I still feel bad. I was so uncoordinated. I, the, the, the strengths that I could bring to reading and, and every other subject failed me completely in phys ed just due to my, my, my brain would just blank on the court of any mm -hmm. kind. 
I will say that of all the sports, I actually like basketball the most. It doesn't mean I'm any better at it than any of the others, sure. but I like it the most. So I was happy at least to say you were <laughs> a basketball coach. But I, I actually digress because what I meant to, to go, where I went to go with this is that even though I didn't expect this to touch me on a personal level because the subject matter was kind of far removed from my strengths, it did. It, it, it even was, spoke to me more than it spoke to Mike because this book is really about, I, th I felt like it's about being a professional in any mm -hmm. field this book can apply. And I would, I would recommend it to anyone who wants to have a career, who mm -hmm. wants to advance in their career. It addresses the, all, the, all the most important pieces from your, just your, your, your work ethic to your image to your, you know, just how goals. How to apply for a job. And yeah, how you to apply that? for yeah. a job. I mean, there's so much practical information in this thin little book. And even right down to, and I loved this, um, you talk about if, if you lose your job. Mm -hmm. Sure, yeah. This is amazing to me because you wrote this book after losing a job, I right? Did. I did. You, you decided to use your time while you were unemployed, and I, I don't know if you were searching for a new one or if you were searching for the next step, but you, you decided to use your time not, you know, sitting on the couch eating potato chips and thinking you were a failure you decided to write a book about your experiences that is an incredible example of resilience and i, I think i think this speaks to that you knew what you were talking about and and <laughs> yeah. losing that job didn't actually re reflect on you in a bad way right well you know in, in coaching it's such a tenuous uh, position and and work in general in this country it used to be that you had a job, you worked it for 30 years, you had a guaranteed pension, right. and you could retire, and right. you would have an okay life for 20 or 30 years or, or whatever. And now people are getting laid off or fired or f for whatever reason, you may be in the same career for 30 years, but it's very unlikely that you will have the same job for 30 years. And people have right. two, sometimes three career changes over the over their work, um, work period. So, I, I, I knew that and I just knew it was a waste of time to be um, angry and, and bitter about it, although I do address in the book that you know, for a period of time I allowed myself that, but, but I just think it's, it's wasted energy. So that was one reason that I wrote it and um, I wanted to keep myself busy while I was looking. I, I was actually trying to, to decide what else I would do, but I also wrote it for, I have some players who are coaches and I wanted, I have a lot of friends obviously who coach. And I wanted them to not make some of the same mistakes I did and hopefully go further in their careers by, by listening to some of the mistakes I did. But I also did some good things too, and I wanted to make sure that they knew that. So it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a teachable moment for me, and that's kind of how I was, was looking at it when I was writing the book. Mm -hmm. Yep. So why did you pick basketball though? Why did that become your sport, or how did um, that become your sport? It's fast paced. It's one of the few sports where you can experience the gamut of emotions within a course of two hours. You can be really excited, you know, in one second and in the next second be dejected and you have to deal with adversity and you have to learn how to win, you have to learn how to lose, you have to learn about teamwork, you have to learn about doing your part and it just encompasses so many areas of life and I, I picked it at the time just because I love it but now I understand that was all that was all part of it, and um, it, it's my favorite sport. It's on all the time, uh, with the exception of May to to September. So anywhere from from October to to the end of April, I'm all excited because there's a basketball game on some level every night. So yeah, basketball is actually the only sport that I've ever tried to watch on TV. Really? Yeah. I was always a baseball guy, <laughs> going to Fenway Park and experiencing that every summer. You know basketball sometimes you'd go to the garden but not too often i hope that isn't someone trying to steal your car it could be okay <laughs> another thing that really stood out to me about the book that was a little bit of an aha moment for me was when you talk about the jobs when you're when you're choosing a job okay i'm backtracking i, I started with you know what happens when you lose one now i'm going to go right. back to what happens when you're choosing one but one thing that you pointed out uh, was Noticing who's already on staff and is it yeah. is it a diverse staff? Uh, that that leaped out at me because um, I I have a master's th master's in education and probably the most formative text that I came across in my 
entire master's degree was um, Bell Hooks teaching community. Um, and she talks about basically the importance of the body in teaching. And what she's describing is that what we teach is going to be perceived differently by every person or right. by, no, by, by our audience or our students based on our body, de depending on our race, our gender, our age, our, you know, manner appearance. of appearance, yeah. everything. Yep. It's all empirical. The, the action, the, well, it's not empirical is, is the point is that the, well, the I mean, knowledge will be interpreted differently right. based on each person. Mm -hmm. But it's and just what they see. Right, yeah. but it, it, it changes how, the, how they perceive and learn. And so if you go into a workplace that has all, everyone looks the same, I think you can tell right off the bat that there's something that, that there's a certain, um, <laughs> I just noticed that was a sports metaphor right off the bat, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, you can tell that there is going to be one mentality, or there's going to, there there might not they might not appreciate a variety of you know, and it was it was something that you know I haven't come across in a whole lot of different texts. So when I saw it in yours, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, there it is. It's that it's that that fact of that we need to be aware, not just of you know the the vague but also the very specific when we're when we're looking at like will i belong here will i be appreciated here um that I, it was a relatively small point it still just leaped out at me because i found that fascinating yeah. when i've studied it in other places yeah well i think you have to be comfortable to be productive mm -hmm. and so when you're looking at jobs i think the important thing first of all is not to judge off of what you just see you certainly right. need to do your research and, and go behind the scenes mm -hmm. and you know dig a little bit but, I, you know, the world is so diverse now, and really, as I say in the book, the only color that matters is green. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's the true. kids that are, are, are being raised today, you know, they've been raised in a very diverse environment, so t 20 years from now will be a lot different. People will look at things a lot different. My generation, you still, I s you know, you still pay attention mm -hmm. to, to those kinds of things. But I think that the, the big point that I was making was that you, you're, you're not going to be productive if you're not happy where you work, and you have to find out what makes you happy with your environment. We're, we're not just talking about money, but we're talking about people, your environment, the culture. Those kinds of things are things that you need to pay attention to when you're looking at a job. Right. And, and, and obviously the leadership structure and mm -hmm. how long someone's been there, and do, do people come and go a lot? I mean, those are things that you need to pay attention to. Yeah. And I would say as a coach, too, to bring this back to the, what the book is actually about, you took it to your players, too. Yeah. Not only did you apply that for your own work ethic, but you knew if there were external factors affecting them, they weren't going to play well. And it, it went far beyond, okay, you know, you're doing horrible tonight, go do some laps. Right. You know, you really, you went to the root of the problem and made the teams a lot more effective. Well, I think sometimes we... When you coach, you have such pressure on you to, to do well, and, and it's, people always talk about wins and losses, which are not unimportant. It, it is important. But it's getting it's there. It's always important to keep score. Yeah. But sometimes we, you have to listen for what kids don't say, and you have to have opportunities where you're not just talking about basketball, where you, you show them that you mm -hmm. care, whether it's a, a, a disciplining moment or you're just sitting there shooting the breeze about whatever. Mm -hmm. and they come in your office and start talking about the new shoes they bought and you have no idea why they paid a hundred bucks for a pair of shoes that they could have gotten <laughs> for 60. I mean, right. you know, those little moments help you, those informal moments with your kids sort of help you get to know them and usually it is something off the court when they don't, don't play well and that's something you have to just sort of develop an ear for. I got better as, uh, as I went along. I still could have done better, but I think it's something that coaches really need to pay attention to because there's a lot of pressure on kids too, you know, not just to win or lose a game, but sometimes you have first generation kids that are dealing with, this is the first opportunity for somebody in their family to get into college education. So there are those right. factors and classroom work and their friends, and they're still trying to figure out who they are. I mean, they come to you at 17 and 18 years old to, there's a lot that goes into whether or not they make or miss a free throw. Mm. Yeah. 
So I just have this feeling that if I'd had her as a coach, I might not have failed miserably at all of my, my athletic ventures. You just seem like just I'm grateful you didn't. such an well, angel. So, <laughs> well, I, would be a lot I don't different. know if some of my uh, former players would say I was an angel, but uh, I think they well, could appreciate what I was trying to do. Angels aren't always nice, though. <laughs> I mean, they, they're yeah. just uh, yeah. some of them are pretty scary, but, um, but not that I meant that about you. But anyway. Um, so your decision to write a book, um, coming back to the actual writing of the book, had you done any writing before in your life? Well, I, um, writing has always been uh, cathartic for me, uh, in therapy for me. I mentioned in the book that I, I lost my adopted parents, so one of the ways mm -hmm. of dealing with that was putting things down on paper, and I just kept doing it, mm -hmm. and, and so I just decided that whenever I have thoughts in my head, I have to get them down on paper. And this particular book actually has been in my head for about 10 years and mm -hmm. I just never had time to write it because you always say in the off season as a coach the season ends somewhere around March and you go okay April May June July June April May and June I'm gonna I'm gonna get this done before recruiting starts in July but you're always doing other things and so it actually as weird as it sounds it was a blessing to have that time even though I lost my job to, to be able to put that down on paper mm -hmm. and it if I don't put it on paper, I don't sleep, and it just <laughs> it's, it stays in my head. So. Mm, I've, I've been there a few times. Yeah. Um, did you, what, what role did books play in your childhood? Did you read a lot? Or? I love to read. Uh -huh. Yeah, I just, um, you know, when I got to, to high school, I started reading more, but it just, it, it takes you to places that you've never been before without actually leaving, and I think yeah. that's, mm -hmm. Sometimes that's the first way that you get to places until you mm -hmm. can actually physically get there. Right. And it's always interesting to read about different places and, and different people. And I love autobiographies. I love reading about people who've done mm -hmm. really well mm -hmm. to see mm -hmm. what they've gone through to get to, to be as, as successful as they are. So mm -hmm. I, I read a lot of autobiographies. Hmm. So well, like oh, I was ahead. just going to ask what the publishing experience was like for you <laughs> going to, uh, especially what is it like to actually work with Chris? Uh, <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, you know, if you're a new author, people don't pay attention to you per se, and that's just, it, it is. You have to be some, you know, somebody like J.K. Rowling, just, she just struck gold and very fortunate for her, but I wanted to, I wanted to have control I know, over what was in the book, but I also wanted to go through the process to see what it was like. I knew that I would have to self-publish it. Chris was great. Um, I, I, he actually is a friend of uh, the math teacher of one of my players, and that's how I found out about him. Oh. Nice. And I just sent him the book. He did not have a sports book with his company, and I asked him to read it and see what he thought about it. He loved it. And so he was very helpful going through the process of, of figuring out um, how to place things in certain, you know, certain places. I, I didn't know anything about the whole publishing process. Mm -hmm. He was step by step. He answered all my questions. He was, he was genuinely interested in making sure that the book came out mm -hmm. really well. And um, it, it, was, he was, it was a great experience working with him. Was the formatting choice to do the little bullet points his or yours, or did you always that? was actually that? the, um, the, you mean the post-it note um, thingies? The, yeah. Yes. Uh, that yep. was actually my editor's right. idea. He, okay. he wanted to, um, and, and I do recommend that you pay to have somebody edit your oh, book. Oh, yes, always absolutely. Um, that. Yeah. Uh, he wanted to, he was like you, he found certain points that stuck out to him, and he said, you know, you need to pick something from each chapter, some point that you're really trying to emphasize and find some way to, to, to highlight it. And I simply just went on Microsoft, and I thought, oh, this looks cool. So I thought it would be cool to have something like a post-it note because mm -hmm. you, it, you use those to remind you. And so right. when someone would go through the book, they could just go to that point mm -hmm. and go, oh, that's kind of what this chapter's about. Mm -hmm. We are huge fans of your book and we're very excited about any upcoming books or other projects you may have going. Well, I just finished filming a couple of episodes of my new show. It's based on the book. It's actually called oh. Coach Like a Mother. Awesome. And it's a show about sports, but it's a little bit different perspective. It's not all about winning and losing. It's I talk about different people with different people about their careers and how their athletic experiences have helped them through their lives and also in the jobs that they do now. Mm -hmm. uh, many people are very successful and they learn so many lessons from athletics and I thought it would be a great angle for sports show. So it's it's called Coach Like a Mother. It's on Woburn Public Media Community Center TV and uh, it'll start airing probably next week. Is that going to be an internet thing too? Yes, yeah, so like I'm actually going to put it on. I have uh, obviously YouTube. I, yeah. I have okay. YouTube, so I Great. will put it on YouTube, and or they can go to my website, okay. um, hmwsportsconsulting.com, and it'll mm -hmm. be on there. So there's <laughs> a lot of really good life lessons in there, and as a, absolutely, again, right. I said, it's 
it's told through the prism of sports, but mm -hmm. there's a lot of good lessons in there. We would like to thank Helen Williams for coming on Scribes and talking to us about her book, Coach Like a Mother. And as we said throughout the interview, this is a book that can be applied to a lot of different aspects in life. If you are a writer, if you want to self-publish, if you're looking for any kind of a job, <laughs> whatever it is that you want to do, this book does apply to a lot of different angles. And even I said parenting, you know, it, it is a wake up call for how you could potentially be sending your children out into the world. Yes, we're very lucky to have Helen join us tonight. And thank you very much for watching Scribes.